everybody. Thank you for coming. We'll get started in just a minute. Just waiting for the thumbs up to start. All right, thank you. Welcome everybody, we're so happy you joined us this afternoon for this session on planning and preservation. I'm Adrienne Burke, I'm a principal planner with Miami-Dade County. I work in a split role, half with our Office of Historic Preservation and half with our Long Range Planning Office. So welcome to Miami, if you're not from the area, we're happy you're here and happy you're here this afternoon. So we are here to talk about bringing historic preservation and planning together. And I am really excited that this session was accepted for today. Um, historic preservation is my passion in planning, and so I'm really, really, really happy to be able to bring it to FAPA. I've actually been watching the FAPA agendas for the last few years, and we haven't had a lot of preservation conversations. So it's really important to bring this to the conference, and so hopefully you'll find it informative and beneficial for your work. So we'll get started. Um, I'm going to, we have a panel, it's not just me up here. We have a panel of three other speakers, but they're in the audience so they can also watch the presentations. And they'll come up and do their part, and then when we're done, we'll hopefully have enough time for everyone to come up and answer some questions. So I'll get started. Uh, today we're going to start with a land acknowledgement. If you were in the lunchtime session, uh, we did one of these as well, and I really appreciated that they brought some action to that one too, so I'll reiterate that action at the end of this, but acknowledging historically the land we refer to today as Miami-Dade County is on the traditional homelands and territories of the Tequesta, their ancestors, and the Seminole. The state of Florida is home to the Seminole, Miccosukee, Muscogee, and Choctaw, and to individuals of many other Native groups. We acknowledge the historical and continuing impacts of colonization on indigenous communities, and will continue to work to be more accountable to the needs and history of indigenous peoples. We encourage all attendees to learn more about the indigenous people in our community and their way of life here on their ancestral lands. And at the lunch session, the action that was encouraged was to donate to the American Indian College Fund, which is a lovely thing to do. Um, I also would just mention, I don't have it specifically in the presentation, but here in Miami-Dade County, for example, in our staff reports for historic preservation, we've been uh, referencing to begin with when we talk about the historic context of a site, we've started, um, we always refer back to the indigenous population first. So we've started making that um, an important note in the historic context of any site that we're working with. So here we are, preservation and local government. And I'm talking primarily from the perspective of a local government planner with historic preservation. So this is just a plug for The Color of Law, which was also mentioned at lunch. If you haven't read this book, please do. It's really important. Um, but I think most of us know that local government historic preservation programs are, are regulatory in nature. That's typically what people think of. They're usually associated with planning departments, but not always. Sometimes they're quite separated from main planning functions. And that's where we've gotten into some trouble with things being separated. Um, I think it's safe to say historic preservation is fairly unknown by the public, unless you're someone who has to interface with that department, uh, and it's oftentimes not a great reputation if you do. And many times, it's not even recognized by other departments within the same government. And there's typically very limited community involvement, again, unless you're a homeowner or a property owner working in a district or with a historic site. So this is my dream for shifting the way we do government planning. And I'm not gonna talk about everything on the slide, but I left some of the things on the slide so you can just see other things that um, I have thoughts about in preservation. But what we're really here to talk about today are a couple of things. So I challenge you to, as you're listening to the presentations today, kind of keep these two things in mind. One is how do we integrate historic preservation with general planning functions in general? And then the other is how can we think about preservation a little bit differently and incorporate lessons from public history and public archaeology. So it's really kind of that twofold component to today's session. Um, and I have in here in red, I think it's really important, and it amazes me how often we don't do this as planners, because like I said, I also work in long-range planning. So, and I've done a lot of current planning too. And it's amazing to me, not just us, but consultants, many projects I've seen, the projects start with ex existing conditions, and it's like there was never anything before that. 
And it's really important to remember as planners, every single thing we are working on has a history. Whether it's indigenous history, agricultural history, nothing exists in a vacuum. So I really encourage planners, whatever project you're working on, whether it's transportation, whatever, look at the history of the site. It informs the project and it really helps when we get to working with the community too. So just to clarify the terms that are used in this session, historic preservation versus public history. Um, you'll see my note at the bottom. These fields are generally really considered separate, which has always puzzled me and many other people because they do seem so connected just by the words they use. Um, but historic preservation, as we refer to it, has traditionally considered protection of the built environment. So it's really looked at buildings, objects, landscapes, sites. It's like architecture, right? That's what people think of. However, this is broadening. So that's another takeaway for today. Historic preservation, if you don't work in the field actively right now, it's not the preservation of 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, we're really, as preservation practitioners, moving beyond the building. We are not focusing as much on architecture. It's really about um, you know, the things highlighted in this definition by the National Park Service. We're looking at stories, events, people. It's becoming a lot more than just about architecture, although that is still the main function of most government programs. So that's a definite uh, area for improvement. And then public history, long story short, based on this summary, is you know, really the way that the public engages with history, kind of self-explanatory. But things like museums, parks, historic societies, walking tours, documentaries, how, how the general public is consuming and interacting with history out there in the real world. Um, so especially given how preservation is shifting uh, in terms of our lens, there's definitely more opportunity to, to bridge these two fields. I'm just gonna go over some examples of communities doing these things well, in my opinion. Um, City of Annapolis did a really amazing project called Weather It Together, and it was a, a major project involving a cultural resource hazard mitigation plan, so sea level rise, huge issue impacting this community um, on the Chesapeake Bay, and it is, um, you know, you think maybe that would be a long-range planning project, but it was really led by their preservation staff. But it involved everybody. And so it's a really good example of how a preservation effort became a much bigger long-range planning effort. So that's one good example of how something was integrated. This is a great example from Tacoma, Washington, more of the public history side. So this is a historic preservation office. It's a government regulatory office. They still do certificates of appropriateness. They still do designation reports, et cetera. But they have a really um, vibrant and active community outreach component, which is more public history. That's kind of the lens that they're working from too. So they have a great YouTube channel that has videos on it, Social Justice in Tacoma. They have these things called the Heritage Cafe series where they're bringing things to the community. And I happened to attend, you won't see this on their website, but I happened to attend a session, a, attended a session they did last year at a virtual conference. And their staff people said they are very intentional about not even using the words historic preservation 95% of the time. The, they said the community doesn't know what that means. If they do, it has a negative connotation. We talk about history, community heritage, storytelling. We almost never say historic preservation. And I thought that was really interesting. The other thing that's interesting is they only have two staff people. So you can do these things without a ton of staff but they have a lot of support from their leadership to do these kinds of things too. San Antonio is another great city that is doing a lot of really amazing work. It's again, local government preservation program, um, but they actually are unique in that instead of just hiring planners, they're I think the only city I'm aware of right now that hired a cultural historian and her background is in anthropology, not in planning. And she does a lot of work with oral histories, um, cultural mapping, and other activities that help tell the story of San Antonio through their outreach efforts um, that has nothing to do with what we think of as traditional historic preservation. So that's another really great um, 
community project. They also do, they sponsor 5Ks through their historic districts. They have a, a hands-on program teaching students how to do uh, preservation craftsmanship. They have a legacy business program. They're really doing amazing work. And again, not a huge staff, just a dedicated one. So these are some other examples of how historic preservation can integrate things more from the public history side of, of the world. Um, these are just some s examples. And some of these examples would, you know, I like to say preservation's on a spectrum. There are people who are on the one end that nothing should ever be torn down, everything should be exactly as it is. There are people who, at the other end, don't really care about preservation, and then there's a whole bunch of people in between. Um, some of these types of projects would probably have the diehard preservation people, you know, like falling out of their chairs. But I think they're great, and they're a way to engage the community and tell people different things. So these are just a couple examples I'll mention. Um, the project at the top uh, left was an example of how to, this was actually before a building was being repainted, and they used colored primer to do these really neat murals that help tell the story of that building. And then they left them up for a period of time, and when they were done, they repainted the building, and it was fine. Um, the one at the upper right, was a community uh, public art project. And they worked with a local florist landscape artist who did these amazing floral artworks, um, and then a, an artist who did murals to help kind of highlight these vacant, decaying buildings, but how there was still life and beauty in them. So there's kind of neat ways to do that. And then the one on the bottom I really love too is from Cincinnati. This is um, a historic African-American neighborhood that was experiencing, obviously you can see, a lot of vacant businesses. And in an effort to help revitalize the neighborhood, tell the story of that neighborhood, in the meantime, while the buildings were vacant, they did this project where they, um, had a, kind of an art wrap installation that highlights some of the historic businesses that used to be there. And so that's a really neat way to help tell the story of a community while you're working on, for example, a revitalization plan. And placemaking. I think we can think of placemaking, which we're pretty familiar with that concept as planners, as public history work. And there's a way to do that as planners, bringing in things important to the history and heritage of the community, like wayfinding, heritage trails, community centers. Um, this one on the right hand corner at the bottom is from American Beach in Nassau County. They have an African arts and culture marketplace at the county owned community center. Um, there are really good ways to incorporate placemaking tools as public history tools. And then I'm not gonna talk about this because I don't have time, but for anyone who wants this presentation, I left this in here because it's something else I think is really important and it's a really important conversation going on in preservation at the moment, which is preservation and equity. So I have a whole other presentation I could do about this, which I'm going to skip, but again, if anyone wants this presentation, I'm happy to share it and you'll get the benefit of all of that. I just couldn't bring myself to cut it out because I think it's too important. <laughs> So um, so what can we do now? And I'll wrap up and I'll turn it over to Ennis Davis, who's our next speaker. If you're a preservation planner, insert yourself into larger planning functions. Um, don't wait to be asked, just invite yourself to the table. That's something that I found to be really important in my past jobs. You know, if you wait for someone to ask the preservation planner to come to talk about stuff, it might not happen. It probably won't happen. So just invite yourself. And if you're a current or long range planner or a consultant, get to know the preservation staff. Again, like I said, every site has a history. Engage the preservation staff. They'd be more than happy to help you with that. Um, and they might bring some other ideas to the table you haven't thought about. Again, every planning project should begin with a review of the history of the project. Start with that acknowledgement of indigenous history. Conduct community outreach and engagement. Some of those cities I gave examples of are doing great work and they're really finding more buy-in and positivity around historic preservation in those communities as a result. Because they're not coming at people with this is what you have to do, these are the rules, this is how you know government enforces your property. They're coming at it with hey, this is why we love history. This is what's cool about our community. We want to engage you, even people who don't own historic property, and they're getting a lot of support for preservation as a result. And then again, broadening the concept of preservation beyond the building, that's a really outdated concept. Um, so just think about preservation differently. And with that, I will turn it over to Ennis.
So good afternoon. So my name is Ennis Davis. I am the uh, vice president of APA Florida in terms of membership and outreach. I'm also a sixth generation black Floridian, which is uh, very important to me because I'm also a Gullah Geechee descendant. Um, so I always like to start my presentations off with the slide of just pictures from my family because I do believe uh, in the line of work that I do, it's a way of giving back to the generations that have come before me and that have sacrificed to allow my generation opportunity to even be here to, to speak to you today. So Adrian started us off, uh, and I'm just going to give you two quick examples of using the public history as a way of integrating it into the planning realm. Uh, I am um, an urban planner myself with a firm called Alfred Benish and Company based out of Jacksonville. And I'm also an in-house consultant to FDOT, Florida Department of Transportation, District 5, which is basically the Orlando, Central Florida area. So the first example of a project I'm going to use that is currently in the process of uh, taking place now is the American Beach Cultural Heritage Enhancement Plan in Amelia Allen, which is just uh, really the northernmost county, Nassau County, uh, in, um, along the I-95 corridor. And uh, this project is a good example of a way to explore the practice of preservation planning beyond the traditional narrative. So the story of American Beach really begins before American Beach. It begins uh, before the Civil War itself. It is located on Amelia Island, which is a part of the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor. For those of you who may not be familiar with Gullah Geechee, it's basically the descendants of West Africans and Central Africans who were enslaved uh, in the Low Country, which is essentially uh, the coastal southeast, say St. Johns County, Florida, north to Wilmington, North Carolina, about 30 miles inland. So Amelia Island is one of those areas where the enslaved were uh, used to cultivate products just as rice and uh, sea island cotton. Uh, one of the communities that originated out of this um, area during Reconstruction was a small community called Franklin Town, which was located on the rural stretch of this island south of the city of Fernandina Beach. Um, descendants of those who were formerly enslaved in what was a Hant, uh, Harrison plantation at that point who helped establish Franklin Town were also affiliated with what became known as the Afro or the Afro-American Life Insurance Company which was established in 1901 or 1900. Uh, the African-American Life Insurance Company during uh, Jim Crow really uh, started to invest in uh, the black community in Northeast Florida. So what Jim Crow would not allow, they would f personally finance for the community. One of the uh, community benefits that this company provided was uh, under the leadership of Dr. A.L. Lewis, the Afro invested in the Black Beach Resort in Amelia Island, just north of what was then Franklin Town, uh, because some, uh, the company at that time had been taking vacations up there doing, um, uh, uh, company picnics because one of the uh, early employees uh, had family that had grown up on that plantation. They knew about this area. So it was basically established in 1935 under three words I'd like for you to just kind of keep in mind, which is rest and relaxation without humiliation. And understanding the history is very important to understand what those three words meant for this community because everything that takes place today really ties back to those three words, rest and relaxation without humiliation. Um, so America Beach became a black beach resort. It's a place where people could let loose, be free, and not worry about um, the segregationist policies of the past. Uh, today, American Beach is still there, and it's very unique because it is still there. Uh, there aren't many uh, majority black beach um, areas in the South these days. So it's still there. Uh, however, they, it does have some challenges. And this project is looking at a way to enhance um, the infrastructure network, as well as tell the cultural history of the community. 
However, in going through this process, you start to realize that there are a number of tourists in the area already. Just to the north of American Beach is the Ritz-Carlton Resort. To the south of that is the Millie Island Plantation and the Omni Resorts. So there's a number of uh, tourists and uh, people from outside of the beach that have pretty much taken over the beach. And uh, when you get back to that rest and relaxation without humiliation, a beach that has been bought and paid for uh, with, from a, a community that didn't have access to these things within the city of Jacksonville, um, that can be kind of sacrilegious, sacrilegious to, to some people. So with that being said, there are some priorities from the community that have come forward, forward in the part of this process, which is really involves around health and safety, uh, infrastructure improvements and enhancement, enhancements, but also trying to balance a lot of the tourism, uh, negative aspects of tourism that are taking place in the community. So where things are headed right now, now that we know and understand that history of the community, we can now move forward to look at traditional uh, planning techniques to uh, incorporate and help deal with some of the challenges. This just a quick graphic here, but to the north of the north side of American Beach is really the most uh, historic section of it. It's largely residential, so there is a need to uh, incorporate. There's an opportunity to incorporate uh, cultural heritage and to the infrastructure itself. So sidewalks that can tell the story of sites uh, in a very uh, non-obtrusive type of way. Uh, in addition, there is a need to balance the amount of tourist traffic that's coming into the area. So just kind of listening to the residents and the story of the past, there is a park to the south of the, uh, south of the community that's separated a bit from the residential section. There's an opportunity there to activate that park a bit more, make a stronger connection with State Road A1A, which is one of the uh, gateways. And the more that space can be activated, uh, you still kind of, you, you can take advantage of that tourism aspect that's already there, but also balance some of the needs of the residents. And then there's a large um, need to conserve the natural element of what is there because that's part of its cultural heritage as well. So the cultural heritage story here is not so much the architecture, it's more the natural and the culture of it being a black beach community uh, that still exists today. The second, um, example I'm going to give deals with the idea of with gentrification versus gentrification and how planners can integrate public history to tell the stories of a community. So what is with gentrification? Uh, that is basically community-led re revitalization. Um, they say if you don't have a seat at the table, you're generally the meal. In many historically excluded communities, we don't have a seat at the table. Uh, I am a black planner, and I, I clearly can tell with an APA, there's not many of us, especially in the Jacksonville area. And even when I come to statewide conferences, we're more of a minority than we are within the state population, yet we do have a lot of municipalities and consultant firms that are basically uh, working to determine what the, cult, what the future of these communities would be. So if we don't understand the culture of these communities, even things that we think are good can actually be a negative to the community. So with gentrification is a way to bring your own seat to the table, even if you're not invited. And so you're trying to get ahead of the gentrification that, or displacement that will come um, in many communities. Two examples of with gentrification, uh, Main Street, College Park, Georgia, is a good example of that. It is a commercial district uh, in the area where the community got together and basically around three um, locally owned restaurants, they served as anchors for this commercial district, uh, three black owned restaurants. Um, and as a result of them bringing in a crowd into this once vacant commercial space, now there are a number of businesses uh, in the heart of this community. Another example is in the Bay Area, the Deuces in St. Pete. The Deuces is uh, 22nd Street. This is where my great grandfather actually ended up at as he migrated from South Carolina back in the 1890s and into St. Pete by the 1920s. 
But the Deuces is an example of a Main Street program which basically helps business owners and local communities self-organize and promote and work together. And the, the story of the Deuces here is that the revitalization process is really focused on the cultural heritage and history of what would have been an early Chitlin Circuit destination in Florida. Uh, and as a result, despite the Pinellas Trail coming through that area, and trails have certainly helped gentrify many, many neighborhoods around that type of infrastructure. I know the Beltline in Atlanta is a good example of that. In the Deuces, that hadn't been the case just yet. Actually, if you look at the last, the last 20 years of census records, uh, all demographics have grown in the neighborhood. And so what's happening is the dollar is starting to recycle within the neighborhood. Local businesses are being energized and growing, and local businesses tend to hire people within the neighborhood, which helps that dollar uh, regenerate and heck to economically sustain the community. So in closing, the east side in Jacksonville is a community where we're trying to get out in ahead of uh, redevelopment in the area. The east side is also a Gullah Geechee community, dates back to 1868. Uh, many of the original settlers in the east side would have been longshoremen uh, with the Port of Jacksonville, as well as uh, local fishermen and people who worked at local lumber mills in the area. Today is very special because it still exists. So I know here in Miami, we're off, a lot of people may be familiar with Overtown, but the historic fabric of Overtown really doesn't exist anymore. You don't see those shotgun homes that used to be here. And the east side is still there. So it's still a community. So, and uh, there's a need to preserve that, or desire of the community to preserve that because there is a lot of redevelopment that is occurring in the east side and around the east side. Yet within this with gentrification approach, there's not a desire to fight new development because at the end of the day, the community does need economic development. It does need job creation. It does need to strengthen its tax base. It is a food desert. So all the new development that can come is, is okay as long as we can protect the community that is there and leave the community in a place to where when this development comes in, it, uh, it fits within the historic sense of place of the community. So the community is in the process of implementing, uh, implementing uh, with gentrification plan. By knowing the history, some challenges start to stand out. There's systemic discriminatory public policy. Adrian has spoken about the color of law. The east side is certainly a community that has been redlined in the past, it has expressways that have sliced it up. Uh, and there is a need to go back and, and change some of these policies that have led to this environment being the way it is today. Uh, there's a desire to limit displacement. There's also a desire to encourage and, and embrace economic development and opportunity. There's a need for additional affordable housing. And there's a desire to not lose any more culture and history because typically that's what has taken the place in communities like the east side. And there's also a desire to have more access to the riverfront. One of the challenges is the, the downtown area, the sports district, which is where the Jacksonville Jaguars play today. That's actually a part of the historic east side that since the 1950s and 60s has been erased and turned into a sports district. So even as the city looks into ways to activate the riverfront, there's still the argument that there needs to be a stronger connection from this community to that riverfront itself. So some of the planning solutions that um, are being discussed today around this with gentrification plan include transparent community engagement, they're moving forward with the plan to be designated as a National Register Historic District as opposed to a local historic district just because that traditional uh, way of going about local districts tend to focus more on architecture. And when you focus on architecture from a historic sense, uh, sense or sense of place and, and background, people who are already ch challenged in uh, maintaining their properties are more apt to lose those properties. So that National Register is more of an honorary designation, but what it does do is it gives more equitable access to federal grants and opportunities uh, for properties within the district itself for those who want to take advantage of them. 
that also will pave the way for what will be a zoning overlay, a more of a cultural appropriate zoning overlay, which can help protect the sense of place um, through some form based code measures, as well as um, really place making opportunities around some of the cultural heritage aspects of the community. Uh, the commercial district itself, there's a desire to preserve its main street. Um, so by the, preserving its main street, one of the things that we're looking at there is got an infill development, higher density infill development in certain spots uh, away from the most historic uh, spots that are currently um, populated by the community itself. And then putting in policies in place that preserve that history, culture, home ownership, and sense of place as well as coordinated infill and rehab housing, and I hadn't even gotten into public benefits agreements and things like that, but there's a lot of tools in the toolbox that are being thrown in uh, to this plan. The last thing I'll just mean, out, mean or uh, talk about the east side here is the need to capture culture through policy. I don't know if all of you may not have been in the session that was in this room, I guess about two hours ago, about loitering. Well, on the east side, and in the Gullah Geechee culture, people hang out. They hang out with their neighbors. Uh, somewhere during the last century, we've labeled that loitering. Uh, that creates uh, conflict opportunities between law enforcement that, and the community, which is just a naturally ingrained uh, thing. So without getting into all the defund the police, all that type stuff, sometimes just change the policy. If, the, if you have a discriminatory policy against a certain group, you can change that policy and just eliminate some of the opportunities for conflict to even take place. And by the same place, you can also create placemaking opportunities that can help economically enhance uh, the community. So in closing, I'll point out a few storytelling techniques for planners in the room for whatever projects you work on, whether it's land use, whether it's uh, transportation or even in the social realm is to remember that every space has a significant historic historical story to tell if we're willing to find and listen to it so leave no stones unturned in that effort and I'll also say that clues about that historical story are always around us it's from the foods that we eat I know if you're up in Jacksonville and you're the north side you're gonna see garlic crab little spots all over town. And the garlic crab is a dish that dates back to slavery. Uh, you're gonna find mustard-based barbecue. That's something else that also dates back to this Gullah Geechee slavery type thing. And then Jacksonville in and of itself has a Middle Eastern um, history as well, dates back to the 1890s. And so you're gonna find some, our version of the cheese steak, which is kind of the, the steak in the sack and camel rider type sandwiches. You'll also can find history in terms of maps, such as sandbar maps, cornerstones on buildings, such as older uh, churches and religious facilities in the areas. Even within your industrial architecture or just architecture in general, uh, oral history to residents, topography um, is another good way to look at things, especially when you're talking about climate change and sea level rise. I know in Jacksonville, typically that means the areas that flood the most, were ones that were once marsh at one point that we filled in. And then the public policies, which I've already talked about, which is, you know, the policies are discriminatory, and you know, change them. So with that being said, I've talked my mint time up. I'm going to turn this over to Scott, and I'm gonna get out of your way. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for coming out. Let's see if I can get this thing fired up. Oop, slide show, I guess. Come on now. Looks a little different to me. I'm seeing it, but it's not showing up. All right, great, thank you. Um, 
Again, thanks a lot for having me here today. I'm really happy to be here with my, my colleagues, uh, Ennis and Adrian and Sarah, and uh, they are really heroes to me. I've, I've had a chance to tour American Beach with Adrian and Jacksonville with Ennis, and Sarah I know through the Florida Public Archaeology Network. Um, I'm a little out of place here, I think, uh, or maybe not. I'm not for this panel, um, but I never thought I would be presenting at a, a planner's conference. Um, I am a historian by training, a social historian, I teach public history. I'm director of public history at the University of Central Florida. We have an active MA program. We train students to go out into the world and do things like become you know, museum curators, archivists, uh, a whole host of jobs in which history is uh, brought out into the world, sort of applied history. Um, I'm gonna talk today about my work with the community of Eatonville, the historic black township of Eatonville. And um, since you're from Florida, uh, you probably know Eatonville. Um, it's, it's historic because of its origins. It is considered one of the first incorporated munis black municipalities in the United States. It's, it, it vies with uh, Princeville in North Carolina for the status of the first. Um, but it is historic and it is recognized. It's on the National Register since 1998, so it, it's, it's uh, been recognized for many years. And as you see in the pictures, it's well signed. When you drive through, you, real, you know this is a special place. But it is not economically well developed and there's a moment here in of transition there's a large property within Eatonville that is being developed and there is a question of whether this is going to be a within withentrification project or a project that is done without regard for the community and I want to talk a little bit about that today um, so this is an article that was in the paper on Sunday in the business section. It's not even on the online section. It's only in print. I'm so glad I get the print edition. Uh, but it's, it's talking about this project, the Orange County School District, um, finally moving forward with selling off, selling off more than 90 acres in Eatonville to a real estate group with ready-to-go plans to develop the property. And this is a big deal because the school board likes this project. Margar the developers of Margaritaville are behind it. And these are some of the features, office space, commercial retail, affordable rental units, townhomes, a 25,000 square foot civic building, 6,600 square foot education pavilion, and a linear park. So you read this and uh, you might say, well, that all sounds good. Um, but you know what's missing from this story? Um, there's really no sense of the evaluation criteria that went into choosing this. This is one of several proposals that has made it through. Uh, others have been rejected in the past, but um, mostly from my point of view, there's no reference really to the historic context of this site. And um, it's called the Hungerford District of Eatonville, but you really wouldn't know why Hungerford is the least bit important. Um, and there's no community input or reaction. This is all about the school board staff saying we really like this project. Um, the focus, this is a business article. It's inside the paper. Um, there's nothing about the benefits to the Eatonville community, the impact on the town's historic character, or heritage tourism, which is a major part of Eatonville's efforts uh, to, to bring people to this important place. The other reasons it's famous, I, I, meant, I forgot to mention this, it's the birthplace, not the birthplace, the home uh, of Zora Neale Hurston. She spent her early youth there and wrote about it in many of her works, autobiography, folklore, and fiction. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about Zora later, but people come from around the world to attend the Zora Neale Hurston Festival of the Arts and Humanities every year. And so you would, might think that this development would be done in tandem with Eatonville to sort of make sure that these, and perhaps those conversations are happening, but you're not seeing this at least publicly in the coverage of the story. And I know that it's not being done with the involvement of the pres preservation people there because they and I work closely together and they really want to be part of this discussion. They want this to be with gentrification. They want to see this to be development that helps, that benefits the town. Um, so the Hungerford property, I've included a few images here. Um, it was one, it, it's now smaller than it once was, but it was once one third of the size of Eatonville. Um, 
Uh, it's actually it was bigger than that. Now that I think about it, it was it, at one point it was it was even larger than that. It was the home to uh, an industrial school campus, an, uh, a, a school in the tradition of Booker T. Washington's Tuskegee Institute. It was later home to the public school campus, the Hungerford School, which started as a segregated school, but then continued on as a desegregated school till 2009. And it's the site of the annual Zora Festival, outdoor festival. So a lot happened on this property. Um, that is only maybe known to those who frequent the Zora Festival or have some sense of the town's, um, the history of this aspect of the town, the Hungerford School. So um, I mentioned that, that Zora writes about this. I've put a few of her works. Zora Neale Hurston is important to the story because if, if not for her, probably the case for preservation would be much harder. You know, we, we can associate this landscape with her. And she actually is one of the most evocative um, uh, memories. She gives us one of the most evocative memories of the Hungerford School. She attended it. And she describes a reading aloud for some white visitors and them sending her books afterward. And so you can sort of feel that the, the, the place comes to life through her words. Uh, not only her words, but I think it's important that she does talk about this site. Um, OK, so this idea of, of involvement, the, the, there is a, an important group in, in uh, Eatonville, Preserve Eatonville community. And it was founded uh, in the 1990s to fight the widening of a road, uh, Kennedy Avenue, which runs straight through Eatonville. They wanted to make a five-lane highway out of it, and they fought it. They teamed up with neighboring Maitland, and they defeated it. And they created this group, and they, they used the festival, in a sense, to market you know, preservation, right? So this group, um, they are not at the table. This is about seat at the table. They have not been at the table. They tried to get to the table on this project by reaching out and partnering with a developer, which I thought was a really innovative approach. They reached out to the Carter Group in Atlanta. And they came down and made preservations to a number of us in, who were involved with the project and said, we care about history. We will do our best to include history. They didn't make the cut. I don't know why they didn't make the cut, but they are not part of this final round. And so the PEC, Preserve Eatonville Community, is largely excluded. Um, they are excluded, too, because the people who are doing this, who are running this search, it's Orange County. Uh, the property was transferred to Orange County in 1955, and therefore there's no legal claim to ownership of this property by Eatonville. It's Orange County property. And so um, it excludes these sort of communal claims to cult this as a cultural property, as a site of memory. They don't have standing. The people of Eatonville don't have standing to really be at the table, and yet we're trying to get in on the discussion and make and get people mobilized through history, through awareness of history. And this where I come in, because I have been doing a lot of research on Eatonville's founding era, and I think you could think of it as planning history. These were planned, Eatonville was a planned community, as were Maitland and Winter Park, which are neighboring communities. Um, and I study that era, and it's a fascinating backstory, which I've been telling locally. But but this project has pushed me toward Hungerford School because not a lot has been written about it or, and it has not been really adequately um, told. The story of, Eaton, of, of the Hungerford School and its place in Eatonville has not been adequately told. And so in recent uh, weeks and months, I've been called upon to make public presentations by Eatonville community members who said, could you make a talk? Could you lead a, 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 a walking tour? So it's sort of uh, taking the history to the people and taking people to the history. So my role has been assembling as much as I can find on the Hungerford property, on Hungerford School, and on the, the people and the teachers and the activities that took place on that landscape that is being developed. And these are some of the images that, are, that I'm finding in you know, my, my searches for, for information about the school. Booker T. Washington Hall. I mentioned uh, that this is a Washington, Booker T. Washington uh, inspired industrial training school founded in 19, 1899. Uh, Booker T. Washington visited, as did his wife. It was very important as part of this network of, of schools. I'm showing you just, just for the visuals. I think this sort of brings it alive. And this is sort of what we're trying to get people to connect to this site, um, is to use images, uh, visuals, to sort of convey uh, what was on that landscape. And I did 
before this all became sort of a development planning issue, I had done an exhibit for the museum in Eatonville on the Hungerford School. It was one part of a larger exhibit and had a timeline, and I've been sort of building out from that. So it's not as if there, the history hasn't been recorded, but it isn't well shared and it's incomplete. Um, I think that one of the things I want to, want to highlight is that it's still important to Eatonville, that uh, N.Y. Nathiri, who is the executive director of Preserve Eatonville Community, um, she's written about the meaning of Hungerford. Hungerford was a way of life, a shared community experience, and it helped to bind even closer an already tight-knit community. It was more than a training ground for life. It, was the, it represented Eatonville's collective priorities, how to provide for future generations. And I think that's really what's at stake now, is will this new development provide for future generations? Will it, will it attend to the interests of the people of Eatonville? It may well. It may be that some of those spaces that are described in the planner's uh, vision, those civic, the civic building or the education pavilion, perhaps those can be developed in ways that will achieve certain educational goals. Perhaps there will be spaces within there for, uh, for classes, uh, for um, uh, and jobs, of course. And I, I did see affordable housing. So there are hints that this project could be what PEC wants it to be. But they are trying to um, inspire citizens to make it known to the school board that this matters to them, that they want to see it developed this way. And so we have been trying to come up with a way to inspire people because the site has been cleared. There are no historic buildings left on the site. So as a preservation project, this is a tough one, right? We're not asking to preserve anything on the site, but to think about how this new, new development will relate to the historic township of Eatonville, which is rural in character, which is small, low scale. Um, and, and as I told you, they fought the widening of those streets. When you see the picture of the development, how will that relate to the historic character of Eatonville? Will it overwhelm this, this uh, historic core? Um, can the memory, the historic relationship of Eatonville, its memory and meaning to the community still be brought into the planning process at this point? And can we mobilize the people of not just Eatonville, but Maitland and surrounding towns to, to reach out to the school board. That seems to be the best strategy right now. And here I'm gonna, I'm gonna just say two, two strategies. We've been holding community forums. This was not my idea. One of the Eatonville, uh, act, uh, an active Eatonville uh, supporter, someone from within the community reached out to me and said, I want to do educational talks through a church and I'd like you to come and give a talk or a series of talks on Eatonville history. Will you do that? I said, of course I will. I'd love to do that. I, 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 I don't know if anyone will show up. They do show up. They show up in large numbers, and they project these on Zoom and, you know, through, excuse me, through like YouTube and the Facebook channels, and hundreds of people are watching these presentations. It's amazing to me, and there's a great hunger for this information, uh, and, and this is the kind of advertising that we do. I don't do this. Eatonville does this, but beloved community, telling the stories of Eatonville and Maitland. We don't talk about historic preservation. We're going to tell the stories of education in Eatonville. And, we give, and, and, a, and as we tell the story, we, we give them a sense of why the site is important. And then, after I'm done, and why Nathiri steps in and says, why is this endangered? What do we want? What is our vision for this property? So it's a little bit of a tag team going on in these public forums. But it's all very community-based. Um, we have partners. We're spreading the word. And I heard a lot of this in your presentation. So it, it's really cool that some of the strategies, we, strategies we're using, I think, uh, align with, with not about the buildings, right? Don't focus on buildings. Um, also, just sort of um, the with gentrification, um, getting partners and, and, and creating uh, a number of people who can advocate alongside you. We do walking tours, and these started small, two people, two members of the Eatonville Chamber of Commerce, and, and me and the other person who invited me. That was the first one. There's now plans to do these regularly. They're get, it's catching on. I do virtual walking tours. Um, and so this, is, this has been really effective. The other strategy, and this is more internal, as somebody who is working from, coming from this as a historian, is how to become more engaged in things like preservation and planning. I did not, I don't have any expertise in planning. Um, I have colleagues at the University of Central Florida who do have expertise in this, 
And one of them, Caroline Chong, she is trained as an urban planner and a historic preservation specialist. She invited me to contribute an article to a journal that she was guest editing called Change Over Time and asked me to contribute something on gentrification and heritage conservation. I, I said, I don't think I can do this, Caroline. I don't know the literature on gentrification. I've never read it. And she said, but I really want you to do this. I think it's, it's pertinent. You can think about gentrification back in time. Think about it in the late 19th century and the founding of Eatonville in a moment of gentrification. Eatonville was, in fact, planned as a counter to the gentrification of that area. African Americans were being shut out, kept out. And she got me thinking about that. And I wrote a piece. I learned so much. And I was so grateful for, to her for, in, in a sense, really pushing me outside my boundaries. To be more like my colleagues, who are preservationist planner historians, I'm trying to understand how they see the world, or how you see the world as planners. And another, just my last point here is, if you all want to do more of this sort of cross-fertilization between planning and history, there's a, 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 a group, a, a conference um, association, Society for American City and Regional Planning History. And I have attended their conference, and it's fascinating. It's wonderful. Uh, planners and historians together, doing sessions together, bridging the gap between the scholarly study of cities and the practice of urban planning. That's a, that's a sweet spot. And so I hope you'll all consider uh, learning more about it and maybe presenting at it. So thank you. And <laughs> I appreciate your time. Thank you. And Sarah, you're up next. The hardest part, right? <laughs> I'm just curious too, how many of you, is this your first conference back in the real world? <laughs> Yay, we're so brave, great job. This is mine too, so if I go crazy, it's because it's delightful be for uh, being in front of people again. <laughs> Um, I'm Sarah Miller. I work for the Florida Public Archaeology Network. I drove down today from St. Augustine, Florida, and my region is from the Florida-Georgia border all the way down to Lake Okeechobee area. Um, and you may know Sarah Ayers Rigsby. She has my job in this area, and she'll be picking me up later so you can stalk me after the talk and follow me to the car and go meet Sarah. Uh, and thanks to Adrian who gave a land acknowledgement and very important for our area to recognize um, the Seminole tribe, the Apalachee, the Miccosukee, and of course the Gullah Geechee, who the corridor goes right through my region. Um, the Florida Public Archaeology Network exists in a nutshell to help protect the state's buried past through education and outreach. So we do education and outreach with schools, with libraries, with anyone, with planners, oddly enough. We do work with um, local governments. So on top of planners and archaeology departments and working with preservation or those in utilities or anyone in a municipal government that may need our help. And we also assist the state's division of historical resources. So I wanted today to bring you a couple of highlights, little potpourri of FPAN activities. And then I thought of one thing as I was listening to people. So I have a fifth thing to add, but we'll save that for the end. But the first one I wanted to share was um, a project started about seven, eight years ago, our cemetery resource protection training workshops. And when I moved here from Kentucky, one of the things I brought with me was uh, a very intense experience of getting heavily involved with excavating human remains from cemeteries that had gotten forgotten, they had to be moved, construction was happening, and doing that over and over again was pretty uh, alarming, and I wanted to see when I came to Florida, what can we do to stop that? What can we do to keep cemeteries in place for another 100 years? So we did these workshops, 
And we've now done 92 workshops across Florida and six virtual ones, have about 1,500 graduates, worked in 30 counties and 45 cities, plus oh, 54 cities and three conferences. And our idea was, can we give people a baseline of information and start to tackle this problem, grassroots styles, with the communities that we work with? So I think these might be on a timer. Uh, so yes, that template worked great. And if you have historic cemeteries, especially neglected, forgotten about, let us know, because we really want to help and shine a light on some of those. Um, quotes like this, death the great equalizer, drive me crazy. Or talking about no matter how big your house is, how recent your car, our graves will always be the same size. Nah. -uh. No, <laughs> it makes me just so angry because you can go visit, you know, just 10 cemeteries in St. Augustine in the area and you will see a pattern that is very clear and that one that goes back to systemic racism and the problem isn't five years old, 50 years old, it's uh, 200 years old, it's 500 years old. It's an old problem that got you to where that cemetery is today. So. We go, we partner with the community, we go to your civic centers, to your libraries, to your offices. Um, we've had one in Palm Beach in their city area. Um, and we do four presentations in the morning to go through how to manage cemeteries, the laws that are involved, how to monitor a cemetery, and how to list them on the Florida Master Site file. And then the afternoon, everyone's favorite, we go out and we clean and we monitor and we uh, collect information on headstones and on the macro issues going on. And then we leave the stewards in place and they go off and do some fine work and report back to us and also come back for conferences. Or if we need to, we go back to the community and do another workshop. We do have this written up, the building blocks of Crypt. It was mostly so other states that don't have a Florida Public Archaeology Network can reproduce it, but you are lucky if you are a planner in Florida because there's a Florida Public Archaeology Network staff member in your region, and we would be happy to partner with anyone to work on historic cemeteries and improving their condition across the state, in particular African American cemeteries, and we have the legislative bill that passed this year that established a task force to address what to do about African American cemeteries. So listen for them. Look look up, they, they have a web page um, at the state and you can see when their next meetings are and try and get on them and give public comment and demand they do more because I'm glad they're listening, but it's, it's, it's such a bigger challenge than even just what's happening in Tampa and even what's happening in Jacksonville and these communities. Uh, we, we need light, as many lights as we can shine on that issue as possible. I also wanted to talk today about our Heritage Monitoring Scout program. And for that, I really have um, Adrienne Burt to mostly blame. She called me about a cemetery in Fernandina Beach, said, wow, I'm working on this plan. It looks like part of our cemetery is gonna be submerged or impacted by sea level rise. And what have you done about this? And that was probably back in 2012. And it's like I've done nothing except cemeteries and sea level rise since. So um, a really great idea that came from a planner and how do we inform people about what heritage resources are in danger. And on top of just telling them, wow, we've got this big problem, what are we gonna do about it? So we developed a monitoring program that engages with the public to go out and check out sites, almost like a annual wellness checkup annually or even more frequently go out, who was last there? What did it look like? Um, was anything broken or stolen or need replacement? You can see here on the top left, Emily Jane and I went out to check out this site, Shell Bluff Landing. We didn't know it was a week before Matthew, so we had the last pictures of the site before Matthew came along and took about five feet off the edge. And we go back and take the same reference photos each time and that well, it's a 200-year-old well you see that's up in the wooden section, it used to be flushed to the ground, and now it's not only in the water, this is taken a little bit ago, it's like detached from the water and kind of slowly going out to sea. So these changes over time matter, but to go out with the public, get to enjoy a site, 
give them some information and how they can help has been great. So we've had, since we started five years ago, 2,400 plus forms submitted. So over 1,600 sites are monitored. We estimate about 4,000 sites will be impacted by a six foot rise in sea level. And then we also have 804 new scout signups. So that has been great. We have a training manual. And I think the best part of doing that was just to help visualize consistently what did these threats look like? How can people from the public identify them? And how can we start to get more uniform information? Another tool as part of Heritage Monitoring Scout is we have a 3D terrestrial scanner. So we like to work with local governments and go out and play with our $65,000 toy. But here is one, Fort Pierce. So this is a municipally owned site. Um, we have done a 3D scan of that. Uh, after some hurricanes have gone through and blown over some of the trees, we can track that volume difference and disturbance to the site. This is House of Refuge up in Stewart, not too far from here. And we've also done a 3D scan of Miami Circle, where I was just a little bit ago earlier today, and tracking changes to that site with the 3D scanner. But on top of great images, they help us scientifically look at things, but engage a very different community that are really interested in 3D printing and scanning. And our land managers, this is Phil Rand out at Tomoka. We printed him a copy of the Bulow sugar mills, which are gorgeous, beautiful ruins in a way to look at. But um, when you feel the model, there is a hole in it because there is a low spot of where water is intruding up. So it helps us understand what's happening with that site. And again, a tangible piece that people who can't go out to that site can also connect with. A fish island that was recently purchased by the state of Florida through conservation funds and is managed by the city of St. Augustine. So one thing they asked us to do was give training to their volunteers who are gonna go out and monitor these sites. So that was one of the very first things we did after our vaccinations were two weeks old is got out with them and a very fine thing to get out with community members to do that. Um, I wanted you all to know, since you're planners, about FPAN's Preservation Atlas through USF, and that is a great resource available to you that you can search anywhere on the map, click in your area, and it will tell you what preservation ordinances relate to the sites that you're working at. If you don't know, you probably know your areas very well, but we find it really helpful when we're working with um, community members, make sure that they're aware of the protections that are there. And you can also use it as a tool to cross compare with other communities. And a few other examples of community outreach. This is one that Adrian and I did back in Fernandina Beach. It was part of a larger preservation um, day, festival, weekend, workshop program. We did a crypt as part of that, I believe. And Box City, if you haven't done that, where the kids have to do permit, pull permits and build their structures. And we did shoebox digs, sort of the above ground and then the underground piece of uh, what they may find in their yard in Fernandina. So that was a good one. Public events, this is us assisting the city of St. Augustine with its 450th. We had this menu of um, digs, walking tours, presentations that they could choose from as just part one part of that 450th. And then public lectures, that's something we've been missing a lot, but trying to do remote as much as possible. And one year we did 68 library programs in one summer, but do a lot of talk with civic organizations and schools as well. Um, so thank you for having me today, but I did wanna add a final thing because um, it's so, such a great honor to be with planners in the room, and thank you for having me today. But it is scary to me as an archaeologist when we lose one of you, when we lose an inspired planner who's in our community, because a lot of the fun things that we get to do are anchored by that person who is really illumined and gets it. So you are our non-renewable resource, and um, I'd be at a loss without many of you. So thank you for having me today and get in touch with your local archeologists because they're excited to meet planners um, such as the ones I know. Thank you.
So I'll invite our esteemed panelists back up here. We have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, and I'll say just a final thought too, listening to everyone's presentation, uh, another good takeaway for all of us, for me as a reminder, is partnerships. Um, I've been really, for the reason I was able to put this panel together is because with projects I've worked on over the years, I've worked with Ennis and Sarah and more recently Scott. So. Again, as planners, let's get outside of our bubble, reach out to the archeologists, to the public historians, to the historians. Um, it only enriches our projects. So that was another great takeaway for me. So yeah, we have now nine minutes for questions. If anyone would like to ask a question, if not, I have a couple I can start us off with. Anyone? Yeah, great. You have to project. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> So, yeah, so that was the Afro-American Life Insurance Company. Uh, so what that was, was around 1900, 1901, it was very difficult for the Afro African-American uh, community to be buried. Somebody died, you had to pay for a funeral. You had to be embalmed. People didn't have the resources. So seven uh, gentlemen within the community basically put $100 into a pot to create this burial insurance programs. It started there. Uh, as it grew through the years, they started to uh, invest in other ventures. Uh, they established the first black-owned soda bottling company in Florida. Uh, when black people couldn't go golf at white golf resorts, they made a black-owned golf resort. Uh, American Beach, if you couldn't go to, if you're black, you could go to the beach, they made a black beach. And they also uh, gave home mortgages to the black community when people couldn't get the GI Bill and things of that nature. So they, and they also invested in HBCUs as well. Uh, but they were a legacy of slavery, I mean not slavery, a legacy of segregation. Uh, depending on what side of the tracks you're on, someone still had to build houses, somebody still had to operate businesses. So there's an economy they had because nobody else would sell black people insurance. Now, after 1964, they declined because you get, if you're black, you could buy insurance from anywhere. So they actually uh, went bankrupt in the late 80s, early 90s. And uh, I'm, Sarah, you're familiar with Memorial Cemetery and, and all that in Jacksonville. That's, they did black cemeteries too. And some of those cemeteries are in a the condition they are today it's because that economic foundation, the unintended consequence of desegregation, ripped the economy out of the black community. And so even in Miami, Liberty City, uh, Overtown, Little Haiti, where we're at earlier today, all these places have similar challenges because companies like the African American Life Insurance Company no longer exists. Here it would have been D.A. Dorsey who invested a lot in the black community here. Okay. Any other? Yes. Mm -hmm. I can answer that really quickly and then I'll definitely, I know Ennis has probably a lot to say about that. Um, but I think our answers are different because of how we're perceived somewhat as planners. So having worked in government, trying to work with African-American communities in particular, I'm a white planner from the government. 
Um, that's not, I'm not embraced with open arms necessarily and for good reason because the white people from the government have not really been there for those communities in the past, uh, to say the least. So uh, for me, um, it, it's a lot of persistence um, and patience. I mean, I worked with the American, so before I was in Miami, I worked in Northeast Florida. That's why I've worked with Ennis and Sarah. Um, for, and I worked with American Beach. And it, took, it takes time. It takes a lot of time. And I think as planners, we're used to working on these accelerated time frames or things have to happen. But with things like this, it's not about planning, it's about relationship building. And it takes a lot of time to build the trust. Um, so just being persistent and sincere, you know, it, it's not about, we're not here to, to necessarily come in and do development, redevelopment. We really just wanna understand your story and we wanna help preserve and tell that story. And the more patient and sincere you are about it, I think people start to open up. Um, but yeah, it, it, takes, it takes some time, um, but it's worth it. And working with American Beach is probably the highlight of my career to date. Uh, amazing community, the most engaged community members um, care so much about their neighborhood and their history. So yeah, it's, it's just a, a matter of time, I think. So don't give up. But Ennis might have different perspective. Because yeah, so he can yeah. he can come into a room in a way I can't, right? <laughs> yeah, so I, I'll say the, the black community in Florida is pretty connected because it basically was the labor that developed most of Florida. We talked a lot about Henry Flagler in this area. I know FEC kind of runs through there. Flagler was sipping lemonade. He was not laying railroad ties. So that black community in Jupiter is probably tied some way into the infrastructure network there. So you can look at FEC's history and even the neighboring cities. Uh, I would also recommend if you have any large black or any black congregations in the region, if it's AME or uh, like Baptist, they probably date back to the beginning uh, of the community. So the church is also a good place to tap into black history because the black church was the social center for the black community because if you're black, you couldn't go into city hall and complain. You end up on a tree somewhere. So the church has a lot of that history too. And that's a good spot for oral history as well. Yeah, if, just to, for benefit, so everyone hears, so the recommendation was the movie Sunshine State, which is, um, it, it's pretty much based on American Beach. Most of that movie was filmed up there. So it's, yeah, it's an interesting film to watch for sure. Anyone, I think we have one more question. Yes, Heidi. Hi. So in, in that case, this whole idea with, with gentrification is you don't go into the community with any preconceived notion. There's no, I mean, I know sometimes we have scopes and things where there's some project that's kind of planned, but you really don't want to have that preconceived notion and you want to have transparent engagement with the community and see what the issues are. So when the issue of housing affordability came up, but there's also this his, his issue of preservation that is important. It wasn't this thing about preserving the architecture necessarily. The, the history was that this space, even in, well, in the black community, is not going to have all the uh, significant materials and stuff that you see in some of these areas because you couldn't go down and pull a permit in the city. You have to just build it with your hands. But there's a cultural story in that. It's yours. 
Your family, their blood, sweat, tears, and equity built that. It means something. So when we understood that was the element they wanted to preserve, but you had the housing affordability issue, then it was, okay, well, if we're not trying to protect what a cornice looks like, we're, let's go the national route because that's a more equitable way to not disenfranchise the communities already struggling financially to maintain properties they have. Great. Well, with that, thank you all again for coming. Thank you to our panelists. We are so happy you were here. Thank you. And I hope you will all leave inspired to bring history into all of your projects. Thank you very much.